Hi Sagar, welcome to the interview. Uh, hi sir, uh, good evening. Thanks for inviting me. Yep. And uh, so this video will be recorded. It might be posted on YouTube. Uh, and uh, so why don't we start with your career profile and what you have done so far? Uh, yeah, uh, I have total eight years of experience. In that, uh, I have relevant uh, DevOps experience, uh, three plus years of experience in the DevOps engineer. So I started my career uh, in the non-IT uh, background, and I have switched my career in uh, like uh, as a manual tester. Uh, after two years, like uh, I have two plus years of experience as a manual tester, and uh, in the same, I got an opportunity in the same organization so that uh, to shift the uh, as a DevOps engineer. So from there, I started my career as a DevOps engineer. That's almost three years, three, three plus years, seven experience. Uh, so yeah. Okay, so you started your career as a manual tester, you said, and then for the mm -hmm. past three years, you have been doing DevOps. Yeah, correct. Yeah. All right. So can you can you share some of your key responsibilities that you have done as a part of DevOps? Uh, yeah, like uh, we are like uh, using uh, source code management as a Git, a GitHub, and the Jenkins is used as a CI/CD tool. And uh, we are, uh, I am working on uh, this uh, Java-based project as a Maven as a build tool we used. And uh, Sonar Gib is used for a static code analysis, analysis, and for the Nexus we use for uh, storing the artifact. And uh, for containerizing our application, we use a Docker as a containerization tool. And for orchestration and deployment, uh, we are using Kubernetes as a uh, 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 deployment tool. And uh, I'm using like uh, I used uh, Ansible as a uh, uh, configuration management tool, and uh, use Terraform as a infrastructure as a code. Uh, this is a brief explanation about that. Okay. Now, in terms of so, what tell me about your day-to-day -day responsibilities uh, as DevOps engineer. Uh, day to day response, yeah, uh, definitely. Uh, daily, I need to check an email before uh, we are working on a pod management. So, based on the pod, uh, uh, if there's working any issues in the pod, and I'll get an email. So, every day, uh, the creator first day task is going to check in emails, clearing the emails. And uh, uh, yeah, based on we are using uh, Jira as a uh, project management tool where the work is allocated to the tickets. Uh, so, that uh, I need to check any tickets is allocated on uh, the of yeah. And uh, in the tickets, like mainly uh, we used to uh, get a work like uh, admin related to task and any deployment related to task. So based on that, we do work on that. And uh, yeah, like uh, based on the tickets and all, we'll work. Uh, okay. All right. Uh, yeah. All right. Coming down to the technicalities, uh, you said that you worked in Kubernetes? Yeah. Right. All right. Can you tell me more about Kubernetes namespaces? and uh, yeah. how they can facilitate multi-tenancy and resource isolations. Yeah, uh, Kubernetes, uh, like in uh, Kubernetes, uh, the names is mainly used to isolate uh, isolate uh, the Kubernetes from uh, multiple uh, users and multiple different teams. So uh, like uh, it is mainly used to isolate the uh, uh, single Kubernetes uh, for multiple users and teams. Uh, so, yeah. Okay, any, any more benefits that namespaces provide? It is provide like it will provide like a security uh, for our uh, Kubernetes cluster based on that like uh, any other uh, user cannot access to our uh, Kubernetes cluster that is one advantage of our namespace. So. Okay. All right. Uh, now in terms of can you explain me the Kubernetes architecture? Yeah, sure. The Kubernetes architecture contains a uh, uh, master node and the worker node. In master node uh, there will be like a uh, API server. ATCD uh, scheduler and uh, uh, control manager will be there. And in uh, worker node, there will be like a kubelet, kube proxy, and container runtime will be there. So in API server, uh, the API server will see the front end for the master node, where uh, it will expose all the APIs of Kubernetes to the master node. And uh, API server is uh, primarily act as a uh, communication between the master node and the worker node. Uh, and uh, next, uh, coming to the scheduler, scheduler by name itself, it is a scheduler. I schedule the work for the worker nodes of, of the uh, worker nodes. Schedule the work to the, the worker nodes. Yeah, based on the uh, uh, input given by the input taken from the API server, it is allocated the work to the worker node as a, a deployment of uh, pods and all this will be taken care. And RDCD, RDCD will be like a, a database. Uh, data is kind of a Kubernetes. Uh, it will store all the information about the Kubernetes in the form of a key value pair, and it will be uh, maintain the state of the Kubernetes. And control manager, uh, it will be like uh, 
combining all the processes which are running on the Kubernetes and it will be uh, managing and informing to the master node. So mainly we have uh, many controllers uh, in uh, Kubernetes like uh, um, replica set controllers, uh, ingress control, node controller, etc. And uh, in uh, worker coming to worker node, Kubelet. Kubelet is like uh, it is also primary node of uh, worker node. It will be run in every uh, every worker node. It, it will be run in every worker node. It is it is the main work of Kubelet is uh, like uh, to get the health of the pods and to maintain the pod is uh, up and running. It is not like it will check the health and, uh, health of the pods and it will give the information to the API server. Okay. And Kube proxy. Uh, Kube proxy is mainly used to like. Uh, Provide the network um, network between the pods and inside the uh, pods for the uh, communication purpose. And where it is the uh, transfer the network uh, uh, into the pods, uh, it is mainly used direct the traffic to the pods. Okay. And container runtime is mainly used to run the container uh, as if uh, mentioned. Can you can you tell me about uh, any sort of challenges that you encountered while having while installing Kubernetes cluster or configuration of the networking? The, uh, it will be like uh, the the pod will be uh, goes down when the when there is the pod is getting restarted. The we used to uh, we have to we used to uh, check the pod uh, logs and all to check where, what exactly the reason it happened. And uh, we have to uh, go to the logs uh, and we need to check uh, in the describe pods and all because uh, why the why it is going to uh, going down. What why is it restarting and all the things uh, it is happening uh, in our yeah. system. And where are you sending the logs to? Where are the logs stored? Oh. Yeah, we are saving a logs, uh, uh, logs in our backend uh, logging just directly. Mm -hmm. So, if you need to send your Kubernetes logs to an external tool like Splunk, mm -hmm. how would mm -hmm. you do that in AWS? In AWS, have you used AWS? Yeah, I will. Yeah, I will. Yeah. Yes. So, if let's say you are using EKS mm -hmm. and uh, you have a set of logs which are generated by Kubernetes. Tell me, how would you get these logs into Splunk? Yeah, for these logs, we use a sidecar container. Mainly, uh, it will collect the logs from the main application containers. Uh, uh, the logs is collected and uh, transfer that into the, our backend uh, store uh, server, like that we used. OK. Are you, are you storing these logs in CloudWatch? CloudWatch? Yep. Yeah, I used to monitor the watch, uh, CloudWatch. Yes. OK, so if you need to send these logs from CloudWatch to, uh, let's say, Splunk, what are the different methodologies in which you can use AWS to export these logs? Uh, export the logs. No, I, I never used uh, Splunk. OK, use. all right. Uh, did, you, did you encounter any sort of persistent storage issues uh, when using Kubernetes? Yeah, persistent storage, right? Yeah. Uh, yeah, uh, persistent uh, storage, like persistent uh, volume uh, we used uh, for our uh, stateful set applications. So uh, whenever uh, there will be like, uh, we, we, we created the admin team, created the persistent volume. There will, uh, we are mentioning to climb the volume, like uh, it depends on the size, uh, size and the accessibility. So we have very, uh, like only one pod, like uh, only one uh, volume in the, uh, in, the, in the where it is created, so on that time the, it is already occupied. So that time uh, we face an issue. So it is in a pending state. It is not it is in running. State. So so we used to overcome this. Uh, we used a storage class. Uh, sort of. Okay. All right. So let's assume that I've got a extremely critical application which I'm running on Kubernetes, mm -hmm. and security is paramount to me. Mm -hmm. So what are the measures that I will take to ensure that my Kubernetes is highly secure? Uh, yeah, coming to the secure purpose, we can use the namespace and uh, we can use RBAC like role-based uh, role access control. And uh, we can, uh, yeah, these two measures uh, in the number. But that doesn't really solve the problem of security. So there are multiple other things that you can apply. Yeah, you can Think use of other things that you can apply. Secrets can use uh, to go to uh, mention mm -hmm. like uh, 64 case to convert the secrets and uh, then implement products. Okay. 
would you would you be able to apply anything on, on the network the network uh, from the vpc part uh, controlling the inbound and outbound traffic yeah yeah we can port level the yeah, nettles and security groups that can be used for this okay tell me something about port security policies port security policies that's all right. okay let's 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 move on to something else uh tell me about what do you understand uh what do you understand by jenkins why why why, why was there a need of jenkins and uh, what's the difference between uh, jenkins and uh, let's say github actions or circle ci then the, the mm -hmm. newer set of tools mm -hmm. And Jenkins is a uh, automation tool which is used to build and deployment, uh, which is used to automate the build and deployment process. So Jenkins, like uh, we can uh, use Jenkins as a CAC, like continuous integration and continuous deployment. We can uh, use uh, Jenkins too. Uh, see, like uh, other than Jenkins, like uh, GitLab and uh, Circle CI, I said, no, I never come across to I didn't get any chance to work on that, so I don't have that much idea. But there also is a market now and uh, boom. But mm -hmm. I used to work in Jenkins, really. That's why, like, it is mainly for CI CD implementing okay. CI CD and automation. Tell, tell me about the Jenkins architecture and the different plugins that you have used. At Jenkins, like uh, plugins, I use like uh, GitHub plugins, Python integration plugins, Sonar Cube's quality gate plugins, and Nexus Artifact plugins, and many more uh, plugins I use. Uh, okay. Yeah. And how do you achieve uh, role based access control in Jenkins? A role based access control. The role based access control is for uh, Kubernetes. No, it can be applied to Jenkins. Okay. What do, what do you understand by role based access control? And it's like uh, giving the access to the role based on the like uh, user access control. Uh, to give the, the access to the user based on their roles. Mm -hmm. Like how can they and access or what yeah. what kind of roles you want to the pressure and all. Yeah. And why why do you think that role based access control mm -hmm. cannot be applied to anything other than Kubernetes? Yeah, <laughs> sorry. <laughs> Uh, yeah, access control in a sense, like uh, we can give the access, like the same IAM uh, rules is uh, used here. I am user, uh, user and group uh, roles we can use to access control to our uh, Jenkins. All right, that is incorrect. Mm -hmm. uh, tell me, now tell me about uh, authentication and authorization. What do you understand by these two words? Yeah, authentication in a sense, uh, like a credential is allocated to a user. Authorization is like policies which our access uh, uh, access is given to the user to access uh, AWS services like this kind of access. Uh, mm -hmm. Authorization. Okay. And uh, what do you understand by identity federation? Identity federation. Have you heard of this term? Oh. Single sign ons? Yes, single sign on. I have, yeah, single sign on. Okay. Yeah, Facebook, uh, same credential and password we can use for multiple uh, different tools, whichever you use it inside the organization for that to be using. Tell me the difference between SAML and OIDC. Do you know what is SAML? Um, and OIDC? Okay, all right. So, <laughs> okay. Uh, now tell me about infrastructure as code. So have you used any tools like Terraform or Cloudform? Yeah, Terraform I used also. Okay. Yeah. Uh, can you can you describe me the different components of Terraform and what have you done in there? Uh, Terraform, like initially we will initialize the Terraform like Terraform by using the uh, command called Terraform init. And uh, next uh, comment we used to like check the plan how it is going to uh, manage our Terraform the plan you know, Terraform plan uh, command is used and when whenever like uh, we have to apply the Terraform uh, for the this thing uh, we have to execute the Terraform in our cloud base so we use the command like the Terraform uh, apply and once it has done everything uh, the state file is created and all the infrastructure is created when want to do anything it will destroy the Terraform. You can mention the Terraform that's just okay. So in, in Terraform, you have a concept of Terraform state. Yeah. Right? 
So how do you address challenges like uh, state drift and concurrency? Mm -hmm. yeah, do you understand yeah. the difference between state drift and concurrency in Terraform deployments? Uh, state drift. I think that means like multiple users are using the Terraform uh, like uh, without uh, locking the state files. So that is one uh, issue I come across before uh, we are saving that data from uh, state into the backend uh, S3 and uh, like uh, connecting to the, uh, we are using the technique that is uh, connected to the Dynamo DB. So before that, like multiple users are using that so because of that, uh, the data from uh, uh, file, a uh, state file is uh, corrupted and uh, everything is happened so that uh, we implemented uh, the backend storage and and we'll uh, link it to the then we to log the state of the Terraform. So this is uh, understand. Okay, tell me about uh, tell me about one of the complex Terraform modules that you have written, and uh, what were the key components in it? Uh, complex in the sense like uh, I used to uh, write like uh, some basic, so it will be there. Uh, like uh, it will be like uh, I used to write some basic like uh, VPCs, the subnets, EC2, uh, EC2. In that uh, VPC, I used to write for the inter inter internet gateways, uh, like uh, NAT gateways, uh, Elastic IP, uh, and uh, EC2s, and EKS also. We are uh, implemented that also. Okay. All right. Now, just having a look at your CV again. Uh, tell me, tell me about the one of the key projects that you are, you have done, which in which you encountered encountered major challenges, and uh, what were they, and how did you overcome them? Uh, yeah, key challenges like uh, I faced in uh, Docker. Uh, when we write in a Docker file, Docker file, the file is like uh, it is taking more time to create an images because of the size size of the document. Because we will come overcome this uh, by uh, creating the multi-state Docker file, multi-state Docker file, so that uh, there will be like uh, uh, in future it may uh, any vulnerabilities attacks or anything happens to uh, like that will be reduced uh, by creating the multi-state Docker file. So that uh, the, after that, the uh, execution of our uh, Docker images is become faster and we reduce uh, around the Docker file from almost 50% to like less uh, mm -hmm. that is uh, okay. All right, now in terms of Docker, uh, what do you understand by the word immutable infrastructure? Immutable. Immutable. Uh, uh, So it cannot be the state cannot be changed. That is yeah, the state cannot be changed after deployment. So how yeah. does Docker support the concept of immutable infrastructure? That's fine. Uh, tell me about the difference between a horizontal and vertical scaling. What do you understand? Yeah. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, vertical scaling instance uh, like uh, we are increasing the capacity of the uh, instance for uh, like an example like instance increasing CPU, increasing our memory and all. And for horizontal scaling and uh, we are increasing the virtual machines uh, to number of machines. So that is called what uh, vertical scaling and uh, horizontal scaling. Vertical scaling uh, there will be like uh, we will come across hardware. Uh, uh, hardware is like uh, like the minimal hardware, and I uh, in uh, in horizontal there is no any hardware restriction in it. And uh, here in vert vertical scaling, uh, there will be like uh, if, uh, like communication between inside uh, the uh, inside instance is uh, faster uh, because uh, the same instance is used. And in horizontal, uh, it will be like multiple instances their communication and networking. Uh, the the uh, communication between them is uh, very slow. Uh, so. Okay. All right. So I'll give you I'll give you a scenario. So your client demands that uh, you need to set up auto scaling for EC2 instances. Okay. So that's that's one of the requirement where you have an application and uh, it should auto scale based on the consumer demand. Mm -hmm. Tell me about the exact steps that you would run in AWS so as to achieve auto scaling. 
what are the prerequisites of auto scaling and uh, how would you achieve that in aws uh, prerequisites in a sense like uh, amazon machine images required for that uh, mm -hmm. particular application uh, which are running on the ec2 and there will be like a launch configuration will be there in that we will specify the what is the percentage uh, of the like when it was uh, the that has to scale and plus it scaled down and what is the minimum number of instances to be running uh, concurrently and what is the maximum when it is uh, achieved so uh, to run and uh, basically uh, the load balancer also they have to uh, integrate with auto scaling so that it will uh, uh, send the loads to uh, multiple uh, whichever newly created uh, auto scaling groups uh, yeah and uh, based on the threshold uh, percentage and all uh, how it is going to be yep. all right now in terms of have you have you heard the concept of service mesh but I'm not sure. So, service mesh like Istio or Linkerd addresses? Mm -hmm. No, I heard uh, that, but I never thought of that. No. Okay, all right. Mm -hmm. oh. Tell me about your experiences with serverless applications. Oh, Lambda. Yep. Oh, uh, Lambda, yeah. Uh, like, you know, project we are implementing Lambda, like, there is a speaker, like, uh, based on, uh, it was written by my uh, senior, like, uh, the lambda that is written in the scripting in python python so mainly uh, it will check the volumes unused volumes uh, in our uh, this uh, infrastructure whichever is unused from past uh, like almost uh, three four months or four, four, six months it is not used for those, those kind of uh, uh, the, the volumes and uh, all the news are uh, easy to machines and all it will get uh, you'll get an email uh, regarding that you will drop an email whichever team is not used at so that from that Okay. And what are the benefits of a serverless architecture? A uh, serverless architecture benefits like you cannot like we are not, not supposed to manage the uh, complete uh, uh, server because whenever the request comes, the server will get activated and once the what, what the work is assigned to that the task complete after that, you terminate the instance and there is the cost optimization will be there. And uh, the drawbacks of uh, this is uh, like it will only for 15 seconds we can run execute our uh, a script or code in that. That is the one drawback. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. And uh, what are the challenges that you face when you are deploying a serverless architecture? Uh, challenges, it will be like, like triggers and all in that. Uh, yeah. I face like uh, maximum, I never used to this. Uh, like I didn't employ, I my seniors is to work on it so that's correct okay tell me the difference between uh, elastic container service and elastic kubernetes service like ecs and eks ecs and eks like uh, i use uh, docker or containers no, no docker is a container yeah tell the do you do you know what is ecs Elastic container service, container service. It's like a AWS service provided to like a Docker, I think. And because we used in our organization as a Docker, so not ECS. So EKS, uh, yeah. That's it. Yep. So e e ECS is your fully managed orchestration service uh, by AWS. You can just run your containers in there. And EKS is something which is fully managed Kubernetes service. Yeah. All right. Now, have you had any experience in in dividing a monolithic architecture into microservices? Oh, experience like uh, I know the things like what exactly the or how it works. But I didn't get any opportunities to do like migration from monolithic to microservices. Okay, can you tell me the? Differences between what is what is a monolithic and what is a microservice? Yeah, monolithic. All the modules are tightly packed the uh, packet, and so all the modules will be like tightly packed. Uh, in microservices, all the modules are like with a run in the microservices single container. So it will be like if uh, anything, any of the one module is goes down, uh, the no com not complete uh, uh, applications goes down, but in uh, my monolithic one like if any uh, services or any uh, module is goes down, uh, complete uh, uh, applications goes down. Okay. So this is uh, 
So are there any situations where you would prefer one over the other? Uh, if you are to if you are to design a new application right from scratch, let's say uh, you're designing a web application. Uh, so you've got a it's a simple web application. You've got a front end layer, you've got a middle layer and database layer. Yeah, would you would you prefer to yeah. you would you prefer monolithic in that? Yeah. Uh, and uh, what are the key considerations that would that uh, you would think of that uh, might change your opinion to microservices? Yeah, it will be like uh, like simple uh, applications like front end, back end, and uh, database will go with uh, monolithic. If there is more uh, features, uh, more uh, features like more implementation, more modules come in, in the, that will be like in nowadays the Docker and uh, microservices like uh, Kubernetes is uh, booming. So that will uh, implement uh, the new trend and realistic things like for that we uh, use uh, microservices. So. Okay. All right, Sagar, I think we are coming towards the end of uh, this interview. Uh, mm -hmm. Just one last question. Yeah. Tell me the difference between RDS, uh, DynamoDB, and Redshift. Uh, RDS is the uh, recent database. Uh, DynamoDB is like uh, RDS is a SQL database, and uh, DynamoDB is the MySQL database. Where, uh, where the, in RDS, uh, the, the data is uh, like maintained in a table, uh, table format. But uh, in DynamoDB, uh, there is no like uh, sequential uh, uh, like manners with the form the data. It will be like a key value pair. Uh, yeah. And that shift uh, in our work. Uh, cool. All right. All right. Thank you, Sagar, for your time today. Uh, what I'll do is I'll just pause the recording and give you a feedback. Sure, sure. No.